Hey, welcome to another episode of Coffee with Creatives. In this episode, we're talking with Mujahid Urehman, a Pakistani photographer living right here in South Africa. He's going to be sharing a little bit about the photographs that mean something to him and also going into how those photographs came to be. I'm really looking forward to sharing this episode with you, so let's get into it. gonna do a clap for me it's recording now so i'm gonna clap as well how's things going this morning all good yeah it's just a little bit of an allergy attack so i haven't slept uh, oh shame so, uh, I, I woke up at uh, half past five started my yeah fast, started my fast uh, went for a walk and then when i came back uh, this room it was closed so it was a little bit of there was like moisture hanging in the room and that mm. that triggered my allergy attack. So I was worried we're gonna have a sneezing yeah, sure. sneezing person <laughs> during the interview, but it's fine. <laughs> and then everyone's gonna think you have the coronavirus or something. <laughs> true, true. And so firstly, just just so that I make sure that I get it right, how do you pronounce your name properly? Because usually I just say sir. Mujahid, but you can call me Muji. So Muji, thank you so much for coming on my video. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say about your really beautiful photographs. I must say I've had, uh, obviously a little bit of time to look through them. Um, but besides that, I've been, I don't know, do you remember how long we've been, we've like known each other on uh, social media? So I have this uh, photography channel on YouTube, Mujahid's Photography. I have renamed it to Mujahid Rahman now, but I remember very clearly that every time I uploaded a video, you would uh, make a comment and tell me how you miss South Africa and how you miss Table Mountain and walking up Lion's Head and being on the beaches. So that is my initial memory of our social interaction. And uh, from there, I think we uh, connected on Instagram and then I came to know that you are a South African uh, living overseas. And I think we started chatting on WhatsApp only in the last year or so. I have my dog here, Charlie. She's in the room. So. Is she curious? Because yeah, because we went for a walk this morning and she's a bit dirty and I don't want to leave her alone in the house. Otherwise, she's going to be on the couch with all the all of her, all of her dirt from the walk. So... <laughs> So you being a Pakistani photographer, now South African too, so could you tell me a little bit about how did you get started with photography? Okay, so when I was a small child, grade 8, grade 9, I clearly remember asking my father for a camera and for maybe several reasons he uh, couldn't uh, buy me a camera. So I always had this uh, fascination towards photography and how photographers take photos and different objects that surround them look, they they made they made it look interesting uh, in their photographs so long story short when i got my first job uh, the first thing i did was with my first salary i bought myself a canon it was a powershot s3is and i started taking photos with that camera uh, i initially used to shoot on auto mode I never thought about shooting manual and then eventually I started learning about photography. I moved to my first DSLR camera in I, ooh, 2008 uh, which was a Nikon D80 and then I started taking photos more seriously but I would shoot anything that came my way, um, flowers, pots, people, landscapes and then I realized that I enjoyed traveling and I loved being in nature. So I started taking landscape photography more seriously. And from there, I just stopped doing other sort of photography, except for portrait photography. I love taking photos of people and landscape is my main passion. And since then, I haven't stopped. Was there a specific moment that you decided now I want to go into, into landscape photography specifically, or was it sort of over a bit of a period of time that that happened? It was over a period of time. What happened was that I used to live near Newlands Forest in Cape Town and I was single then. So I used to 
go to Newlands Forest for photography and for walks and I made a lot of friends through the walks as well. But I realized that the more I was alone in the forest by myself, enjoying the streams uh, coming down the, the mountain and the being in the forest made me feel more alive. So eventually I moved towards shooting just the forest photos. I used to spend hours and hours, sometimes I would go before sunrise and take photos in the forest and make time lapses. And then I realized one day, I think I need to pursue my passion in landscape photography. So I started photo taking photos of Table Mountain. I remember uh, having a notebook with me and I started realizing, okay, this is from where the sun sets. This is where the sun rise, rises on this particular beach. And I need to be there at sunset and sunrise. So eventually I drifted away from other forms of photography and just kind of switched to landscape photography. And I love traveling. So then I would actually plan my trips according to the natural spots that were there and not the cities and the, you know, like people get fascinated by architecture in Rome and Italy and other countries. I stopped traveling to those places. I used to travel to those cities, but I just plan my trips to travel to natural places. Being based in a place like Cape Town, we have so many um, amazing places for landscape photography and also in the surrounds, um, there's quite a lot of different um like different variety like you can get the ocean landscapes and mountains and then you can go to the deserts which is not so far from cape town as well that is so correct yeah. i sometimes uh, as a foreigner in south africa well south africa is my home now but sometimes when i think of going to another country i don't know how i am going to survive even back in pakistan because <laughs> south africa has really really spoiled me uh, there are beaches here, like you said. We have Table Mountain, which is one of the natural wonders of the world. We have forests here. They're not ind indigenous forests, but there are indigenous sections within the forest. And like you said, we have the Karoo Desert not far from here. And as you go up north towards Namibia, the landscape is just stunning. So we have a lot of options here for shooting landscapes. In saying that, let's start going through some of your photographs that you've sent me. So this is taken in Finland, Arctic Circle, at sunset. So this is a blue hour shot, and this was not planned at all. So my wife and I, when we arrived in this place called um, Palas, in the north of Finland, we basically uh, scouted a forest in the Arctic Circle area for the whole day. And I remember crossing a bridge and my wife said to me, hey, we are crossing the bridge over the river. This will make a nice landscape shot. And I said, hmm. no, I want to take the photos in the forest. And I had this preconceived idea of trees during the sunset. So I spent a lot of time in the forest and we went back to our hotel. I came back to this location at sunset time. And when I was in the forest, I realized near sunset time that the photo is just not going to work in the forest with the trees because the 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 trees were so dense they were blocking the light so i was a little bit of uh, a little bit disappointed and on my way back i just decided to go to the bridge just to say goodbye to the whole of the nature area and it was past sunset and as i went onto the bridge my heart just started pounding this was the scene in front of me, blue light, moon rising from sure. the opposite side of the sunset. It was full moon. I didn't even realize that it was full moon. And the river is oh, wow. jet black. So, you, you know, I mean, I have goosebumps right now because I'm just back into that moment. <laughs> when, you, when you take a photo as a landscape photographer, you are not only taking a photo, but you are feeling the atmosphere as well. So slight breeze and like a little bit of dampness in the air, uh, music of the river flowing from one side to another, soft snow and the trees on each side and the rising moon. It was just a stunning moment. Uh, and when I, when I took this shot, I even have a YouTube video on that. I just said to myself, Arctic Circle landscape shot is kind of ticked off my bucket list yeah. because this is the moment that I always remember. 
So after taking photos, I even took a few photos with a telephoto lens just of the rising moon and the trees. But this is one of my memorable moments um, from that trip. And that is why I have got it as a shot in my portfolio as well. It is really beautiful. The one thing after speaking now with you or after listening to what you were saying, I didn't actually realize that it was the moon. I don't know why I <laughs> thought it was the sun. <laughs> I'm not sure what made me think it was the sun, like especially now that you've said it's the moon. But my initial thing was, oh, it's the sun. I was thinking, obviously, this isn't in South Africa. It's somewhere up north. But I thought it's just the sun and it's very low and quite a dark sun through all the clouds maybe or something so because yeah. of the suns because this was taken after the sunset the light was quite blue because of the full moon so mm. it goes to show that you must listen to your wife yeah that's really good there was this funny saying i heard once where it was the you know the whole saying of like if you're the man then you the head of the family and then they said, if you're the wife, then you're the neck. And the neck like turns the head. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. That is so true. Well, I was thinking about what you were saying now about this photo not being a planned shot. Because is it, I mean, I'm not a landscape photographer, but when I've looked up about landscape photography, it seems like there's usually a lot of planning that goes involved in taking a photo. Usually it's not oh, there's a nice, you just walking down a field and there's a nice scene and let's take it. It's normally like, oh, you've scouted, the lo you've scouted the location, you've done research on, you know, at what time the shadows are coming over and all that kind of stuff. Um, is this often for you to take a picture that is, in a sense, unplanned? Or do you normally, uh, how does your process normally work with that? So some of my favorite photos are unplanned. Um, I kind of knew the location, but I wasn't expecting to be at that spot. So I will tell you a little story um, for the next spot as well. But uh, there is a lot of planning that goes into landscape photography. You can't just pitch up at a location and say, OK, I'm going to take the photo today. You need to know the sunset, sunrise. And in this case, moonset and moonrise, you need to know uh, what is going to be your foreground if you are shooting with a wide angle lens? What is going to be your middle ground and background? So you need to find a subject and you can't just find it by pitching up at a location. So there is a lot of planning that goes there. But one or two of my favorite shots were completely unplanned. So you sometimes get lucky. You are driving through an area and you realize, hey, there is a there is a thing here mm. and that uh, attracts me. So let's rather wait, wait here until sunset or at sunset time, sometimes you are disappointed and you just walk a little bit further and you realize, wow, the scene has just completely changed. So let me rather take a photo. So this is a very famous spot for South African landscape photographers in the Western Cape province. This is a place that the South African photographers call the cauldron. I call it the bowl. People call it the cauldron. And okay. this was discovered by one of my favorite photographers, Hawkart Milan. He is a I believe he's a top landscape mm. photographer in, in the country. And he discovered this place in a town called Arniston, which is like 250 kilometers away from South Africa. So before I knew about this spot, I used to go to Arniston in any case because the coastline is just amazing. There is a beautiful hotel there. You can stay there. So when I came mm. to know about this spot, I discovered this spot and I started going there to take photos at sunrise. So this is like a sunrise location. You can't take photos here at sunset. You can, but most probably you're going to be disappointed. So the fascination of landscape photographers with this spot is that the water goes into the cauldron at high tide. And that makes interesting patterns. And sometimes you can even jump onto the surface of the cauldron and take photos next to it. So it was spring tide that day and I would not have gone down because I would have been like long gone by sun before sunrise into the ocean. So I took <laughs> photos at this spot, but there is another spot next to it. So I was taking photos of sunrise at another spot. And after sunrise, I decided, okay, let me just go to the cauldron and see how it is looking at the moment. And when I arrived at it, it was just the perfect tide. The water was going out of the cauldron and receding back. 
and I set up my camera and the light was just perfect. So this is after the sun, sunrise and the reason it is special to me is because I feel that some photos despite having you know this is a popular location so this is not my own invention or my own discovery. So I'm going to a popular location inspired by some other person. So the reason I feel special about this photo is because I believe that a part of me as a photographer has been developed by just going to this location over I think um, like I went there about seven times so this was my seventh attempt to go and get a photo of the cauldron and take it off my bucket list so this photo is special to me because of the beauty that surrounds it also because it it gave me the sense of perseverance that if you want to succeed in life in landscape photography you need to be consistent you need to work hard and you must not give up and i think the moment was just there for me to capture it and by that seventh attempt i had practiced enough i had learned a lot on how to do seascape photography so the what i say is that the rocks in the foreground are like mordor from lord of the rings and the water is like rivendell from lord of the rings it's like foamy and white and it's just going into that central golden point and then the clouds are kind of on fire and they have texture there is green color in the water there is orange in the in the background on the clouds so all in all it actually makes an interesting composition yeah it's it is really beautiful i was thinking about the timing of having to do this because you say it mostly works at sunrise and then also high tide so obviously high tide isn't always at isn't always at sunrise um because the tides like shift throughout the whole day and each day it sort of shifts up by i think an hour or two hours or something like that so to get this there's definitely a lot of planning involved in making sure high tide is at sunrise and yeah and then with and then with a scene like this with clouds in as well, that must also be tricky because you're not sure if the if the sun's going to break through or if it's not, if it's just going to be gray. Yes, true. Um, if you see the video behind the scenes, as I am walking towards this point, I look at the camera and tell everybody there is a small gap in the horizon. And I already told my audience that it's, it's either going to be a pre-sunrise shot or a sunrise shot because as the sun rises it's going to burn the clouds and after that it's actually uh, going to disappear behind the clouds and they will be flat light so i kind of knew mm. um, i have to be extremely lucky for that gap to remain and not be blown away or get covered by the clouds so it's not only planning but it's also luck because you know when the sun is going to rise you know the direction of the sun you're going to you know what time the tide is going to be up but you don't know how nature is going to behave so you need to be lucky you you have to be on the right location at the right time but you have to be on the mercy of nature i find it interesting how many it from how you're talking about your photographs, how many, in a sense, like life lessons there are that you learn through photography that are applied in our regular life. Or I'm not sure if that's how you see it as well, but um, like the things you say uh, um, about working hard or about um, uh, about having patience or like being at the right place at the right time there's all those things in going back like seven times to try something it's interesting how many correlations there are with 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 what it takes to be a good photograph or what what it takes to be a good photographer and in a sense like life lessons sometimes you consciously realize what lesson you're learning and sometimes it's just in your subconscious so for me, when I look at these photos, I look back at the failure. So this is what you're seeing are colorful photos or, you know, nicely composed photos. But there is a lot of 
um, I don't want to call them failures, but there are were there there have been a lot of opportunities to improve and learn. So when I took this photo of the cauldron, if I were to show you the photos that I haven't shared with people, there are like maybe a hundred photos. And if, <laughs> even on that particular day, I had to wait for the waves to right go in at the right time. So. So I had to take like multiple shots to get it right. So you, you kind of have to keep trying and trying and trying. And I think that is what the, what life is all about. You, you mustn't give up. You must, uh, you know, take everything as an opportunity to learn and keep growing. Otherwise, you will be a couch potato. So this is Pakistan, Punjab. Punjab actually means Punj in Punjabi, which is my second language, means five. And Ab means rivers so it's a land of five rivers five Ooh. rivers go through it and punjab is the province to which i belong i speak punjabi which is my second language urdu is my first language so this is one of the villages in punjab and it's very special to me this photo firstly because i was with my best friend there in his village in under his hospitality which was, uh, his family was very kind to me. They hosted me. And then on my friend's motorbike, we went into several villages and we spent the whole day just talking to people. They welcomed us. They gave us tea. They gave us food. They didn't want us to leave without staying there for a night. So people were very kind to me. And uh, they even like a uh, little bit smiled on my Punjabi because I haven't spoken Punjabi in like 12 years. <laughs> so they they picked up that I was not uh, living in Pakistan. Otherwise, my Punjabi would have been fluent. So I spoke to them and I showed them my camera equipment and everything. So at sunset time, I said to my friend, look, I've got everything with me. We need to take a photo of sunset. The clouds are there. And if the clouds kind of burn then we can have a lovely uh, canola shot. So canola fields or mustard fields are quite common in that region because uh, they are used to not only feeding, they don't only feed humans with it, but also the animals with, uh, with it as well. So when I arrived at this spot, I saw an opportunity and I knew if I look down towards the canola flowers, then the sun will light them up from the background. And as I was taking photos, there was there were a bunch of guys. They came to me and they said, you are in our village and you are in our land. So I thought maybe I should move away. And I said, I'm really sorry. I came in without permission. And they were like, they told me, it's not because we are offended. We are saying you went past our house and you didn't stop and didn't give us the opportunity to host you and feed you and offer you tea. So I had to tell them, look, I'm here to take photos. Let's chat and get to know each other. So they were like 12 guys standing behind me, seeing me, how I am setting up my <laughs> camera. They asked me about the price of the camera and what camera is this and what lens is this. So as I was setting up, I was talking to them. And when the moment came, I took this photo. It's very memorable to me. It's basically dark green canola, yellow flowers, surrounded by beautiful atmosphere of the village, birds chirping, uh, cows in the background with the bells uh, on, their, on their neck, and uh, dogs barking. And far away, there is a setting sun with some dust on the horizon and clouds. And it's just memorable for me. And uh, the funny thing is that I told one of the villagers that, hey, the, the, after the sunset, the clouds become pink and that will give me more opportunity to take photos. So as the sunset, I just packed up my bag and he reminded me, sir, you told us that the clouds are gonna turn pink after the sunset and why are you packing up your bag? So actually, after taking this shot, I ended up taking more shots, which are also quite nice. Uh, so <laughs> I listened to the villagers uh, which were who were giving me back my own advice. Hmm. Sure, it's very beautiful. I would love to go there one day. 
if you look back at your pictures, like for example, this one, how much is that experience of what it took to take the photograph? How big a part of when you look at this picture is that? So um, if I understand your uh, question correctly, you see photography is a journey and photo is the highlight of that journey. But these photos play an important role in my life in a sense that I go back into these moments. So at the end of my life, one day uh, on my deathbed, if I, if I have to think about my life, if I think about my savings or my property or any material aspects of my life, I will not count them, but I will count these moments which are more precious to me. There is a story behind each image there are memories associated with the image of me being with my family or with the villagers or by myself. Actually, I feel more alive when I'm by myself. And those are the moments that are my legacy to the rest of the world. So when I share my videos on YouTube, one day I will be gone, but maybe my son or my grandchildren will be able to see those videos and say, hey, this is what our grandfather did. And this is what he had to share with the rest of the world. So it's the spirit that has kept me alive. And they these photos play an important role. Sometimes I watch my own videos and my wife tells me who watches himself. And I say, I'm not watching myself. I'm watching myself being in those moments. Okay, so the name of this tree is Papa Sabuam, which means our father's tree in Afrikaans. And there is an interesting story behind it, which is also a story of hard work, of being persistent, and going after your goals in life. And my family was overseas once, and I decided to take a trip on my own in the Karoo region of South Africa, which is not very far away from Cape Town. And I had no bookings of any bread and breakfast. I decided I'm gonna sleep in my car. I packed my bag for two nights and I went out. So there is a place called Oberg Pass, which I'm sure you have uh, traveled as well. And I was going towards Oberg Pass to spend a night there. And as I was going through the dirt road, I saw this tree. And when I saw this tree, something that struck me about its history, who planted it, who stood under it, how many nights have this tree seen? How old is this tree? How many storms and how many snowfalls this tree has seen? What is the history? And how many people have actually just gone past it without noticing it? So everything in life has got history associated with it. Every spot in the world, somebody must have stood there once and, you know, eaten food or smoked a cigarette or just stood under it and looked at that place in an awe. So... I looked at that tree and I took a photo of it and I just decided, okay, one day I'm going to visit this tree again. It looks like a very special tree. And long story short, I met this lady in an airplane on my way to Dubai and I showed her this photo <laughs> just by chance. And she said that her husband planted that tree 40 to 50 years ago. What? So in the plane, yeah. I met this lady who told me the background of this tree. And she said to me, there is a farm next to this tree which belongs to her and her husband. And I'm welcome. Um, she, she welcomed me and she said to me, I can go there at any time and I can stay there. I can put my tent there and I can even stay in their house. So I made friends this with lady and she told me it's called Papa Sabuam because the kids call this, uh, rem remember this tree as their pa father's tree. So I decided I'm going to take a photo of this tree with the Milky Way one day. And uh, I went there once, took photos of the tree with Milky Way. I wasn't very happy with the quality of the photo because of the lens. And I decided I'm going to visit this place again. And I visited it. I think I have visited this place like four or five times. And uh, last time when I went there, I went with my friends there and took the photo of this tree at night time. So uh, there is the Ta Oberg Pass next to it, which is a pass that actually leads you into Tankwa Karoo Valley. And 
I had this dream of not only spending a night there, but also seeing that valley at sunset time. And I took photos of this tree at night, but at sunset time, I was lucky because there was cloud cover. And just to see this tree before an amazing sunset made like gave me a double treat. So my dream of seeing Tankwa Karoo Valley at sunset with amazing cloud formation came true. And the same night, tree with the Milky Way uh, came true. So the tree is very special to me. And I think it's my favorite tree in the world. Yeah, wow. That's a, it's an incredible story how that all happened. So this picture you only took after you met the lady in the plane? Is, that, is this after that? Yes, yeah. yes. I have a few photos of the tree before I met the lady. And I have that um, those as well, but those were taken during the day. Sure. That's incredible. And it's incredible sort of to see a real example of how a picture can actually bring people together in a way that's like you would never expect it to happen. Uh, we speak, uh, speak mm. quite often and... Mm -hmm. um, during Ramadan, they came to my house and broke fast with us last year as well. And I have stayed at their farm wow. a few times. Wow, that's really cool. Um, have they got any of your prints of this tree by any chance? No, I have actually promised uh, her a few times that I will print this large and give it to her as a gift. But I haven't come to doing that. So maybe it's time that I should do it. That's a really interesting backstory. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I got this cough. <laughs> the virus, the virus has struck. <laughs> yeah, the virus is coming. <laughs> if you are a Cape Townian or if you are a South African, I don't think I need to introduce Table Mountain to you. Table Mountain is one of the natural wonders of the world. And if you are away from Table Mountain in Cape Town or if you are on top of it, to a landscape photographer, it provides a lot of opportunities. And... To me, shooting at Bloberg Strand, one of the beaches in Cape Town, and shooting towards Table Mountain with this grand atmosphere has always been a pleasure. This is not my only shot of Table Mountain from Bloberg Strand. I've got, um, I think, 15 or 20 photos, and I'm really proud of all of them. This photo has also given me a lot of friendships because I'm not the only photographer who goes there. There are a lot of famous photographers from South Africa who go there. And because of that, we I have got them on my WhatsApp. So if I want to go to Bloberg Strand, I always message them to say, hey, how is the weather looking? Should we meet there? And we always meet there and take photos together. So the sentimental value behind this image is basically friendships it's also hard work it's also like a tribute to nature because it's one of the natural wonders of the world table mountain and you know i don't think any picture can justify the what's the english word grandeur of yeah. of Table Mountain. It's majestic, it's mesmerizing, it's attractive, it's it's beautiful. So Bloberg Strand has got a lot of composition. So this is one of the composition through one of the water channels. You can take photos from the beach. There are rocks there as well. There, there are water pools. You can take photos. So Table Mountain has got a variety of photos from Bloberg Strand. So this image is special to me because of its composition because I was shooting with my friends. I think there is a photographer standing on the far left side. Yeah. So, yes. yeah. So if you look at the rock formations, they are absolutely stunning rock formation. The texture in them, the water is quite foamy. The, the sky is burning with pink color and table mountain with all its might standing there. And it tells you a story of a guy just looking towards Table Mountain. And I'm sure that guy must have been in awe as well. He was actually a photographer taking a photo. I have uh, removed his tripod using Photoshop. So for Table Mountain is special to everybody in Cape Town. 
and I never get tired of seeing Table Mountain every day. I live near Table Mountain and every day it mesmerizes me. Hmm. How do you decide whether you want to include um, a person in a landscape in a landscape photo or you want to keep it plain? Is there a thought process in that or does it just depend if you're with people or how does that work for you? So I guess when you want a person in a photograph is when you want to give contrast. So Table Mountain is huge and you want to tell a story as well of a guy who stood in front of Table Mountain or a tree or in front of a canola field and saw that place in an O. And because I was using a wide angle lens, I knew that the person is going to look small. In this case, I didn't have a choice because he was my friend and he decided to stand right in front of me to <laughs> compose his shot. So I knew he was going to be there. He took permission from me and I said, just stand there and I will either remove you completely using Photoshop or I will keep you there. So I love having a person in my images it's not always possible and it doesn't always suit the style of the image that you are taking but sometimes if there is something big in front of you and you want to show how small we are in the bigger context of a landscape then I always try to include a person with a red jacket or a yellow jacket or an orange color jacket these are the colors that attract me quite a lot and I think they kind of pop in a landscape as well. Sure, I must say, it's a really beautiful collection of, of images. Wow, thank you for sharing. How do you, um, Shame, you must be really looking forward to being able to go out and do this again. How are you, how are you feeling? So, I think in the last year and a half, I haven't done a lot of landscape photography. I had a terrible accident in 2018. 2019, I was performing Hajj, which is a compulsory pilgrimage for Muslims once in a lifetime. I was also recovering. I was on wheelchair for quite a long time. I was limping for quite some time. And then 2019 was over in a blink of an eye. And 2020 happened. And I think all, I don't need to say much more about 2020. It's just lockdown and social distancing and no traveling at all. So it has given me a lot of time to think. I've got this notebook in front of me where I always am noting down my thought process. So being in lockdown has given me ample opportunities to think about elements of a photograph like light and composition and evolution of a photographer and quite a lot of things that I'm not a philosopher, but quite a lot of things that are on philosophical level. So I've been making videos about those kind of things re recently, but I'm itching to go out now. I don't have any specific plans because I don't know when the lockdown is going to be over in what season will I be able to go out and take Milky Way photos? Will I be able to go out and take sunset or sunrise photos? So I, I can't really plan, but I'm itching to go out and I'm itching to travel. I would love to go and even, let's say, shoot Table Mountain just at the sunset and uh, be with my friends and enjoy the atmosphere and feel the 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 sand and in my in my feet and observe the waves crashing on the rocks so those are the things i'm longing for mm. i think just looking at your pictures it, it really takes you to those places like if you know uh if i look at some of these pictures that you've taken it for me, it feels like it puts me in that space. And even though we're in lockdown and I'm not anywhere near the beach, uh, especially if you make them really full screen, <laughs> it feels like I'm right there. It's amazing. It's very, very cool. cool. Well, if you feel um, that way, I think I've done my job well then. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> I think I need to get some prints here of yours too. That would be great. Thank you for coming on here and for sharing your insights and uh, your view on life and uh, all your beautiful, your beautiful photographs. Um, it's been very inspiring to see. Yeah. And um, a last question, if you had to give an aspiring landscape photographer any advice, what would you tell them? It's not about gear. It's about learning 
how to take the photos with whatever you have gear initially doesn't matter it is about learning the ins and outs of landscape photography and knowing your camera more knowing your equipment more and you will eventually feel the need to upgrade your gear and that gear will support you in whatever you are trying to do now so be consistent keep learning keep going out keep shooting and always be open for receiving feedback from people who know more than you and one more thing i will say is that in this modern era where we have instagram and flickr and youtube do not be intimidated by what you see on instagram likes and sharing of your photos and number of followers they do not matter what matter is how you are progressing and how good your photos are whether somebody taps on the screen once or twice doesn't really matter so you know just keep moving keep moving forward and uh, success will be yours cool thanks for watching that i hope you enjoyed what muji had to say and all of his insights into his landscape photography if you'd like to follow him take a look down at the links below he has a youtube video for each of the different photographs that he's taken with all the behind the scenes and it's super interesting to go into it if you have any suggestions of who else i can interview for this project please also you can let me know anytime in the comments and yeah i'll see you guys in the next video